this video, we're going to talk briefly about critical state soil mechanics. So this is going to be a, a little primer on this topic, not really a, a, a full lesson, but I think it's a really valuable concept in soil mechanics. It's one of the most important concepts in soil mechanics, so it's worth talking about, even though it's maybe a little more advanced than what is typically covered in an undergraduate curriculum. So the idea is something we've already kind of shown in some of our plots. Switch view here. Um, so here's a plot showing deviatoric stress versus deviatoric strain. And we know that there's going to be a curve to this stress strain relationship and that it'll eventually reach a flat plateau up here. Uh, volumetric strain has the same property of reaching a plateau. This one is initially contracted before becoming dilated. Then we reach this flat line right there where there's no more volumetric strain as the deviatoric strain increases. That's a concept that makes a lot of sense. It would be really nonsensical to think that as you continue applying shear strain, the soil is just going to continue growing forever, right? That doesn't make sense. We know that dead sands tend to dilate more than loose sands. Well, as the sand dilates, it's becoming less dense, right? Dilation means that the void ratio is increasing. The sand is moving from being dense toward being loose. So it just makes sense that eventually the dilation has to stop. Or from a micro-mechanical perspective, a particulate matter perspective, the, so the sand particles need to move up to get past each other. After they've moved up, you've got that dilation. They can move past each other without continuing to move up anymore. And they just slide past each other and kind of roll around. So that condition is the critical state. When the deviatoric strain becomes large, the particles have undergone a lot of movement past each other, they've dilated, done what they're going to do. You reach this critical state condition where the soil can continue accumulating deviatoric shear strain without accumulating any deviatoric shear stress or volumetric strain. Or put mathematically, the dilatancy is equal to zero. So dilatancy is the volumetric strain rate divided by the deviatoric strain rate or alternatively, it's the tangent slope of this volumetric strain versus deviatoric strain curve. Uh, okay, let me come in, let me go to uh, CCLE and I'm going to show you a couple of videos here. Um, I'm going to turn off my video so you can see this, this full screen. Now, let me explain what's happening in this experiment. We have some quartz sand particles, which you can see through a glass window. And then um, there's a metal plate on the top, kind of pushing down on the sand. And on top of that metal plate are springs that are applying some, basically you can consider it like constant vertical stress in a way. So the, the top plate is free to move up or down as the sand is sheer if the sand wants to dilate or contract. Okay, and then on the bottom there's another plate, and that plate's going to move from the right to the left. So the sand is under pressure, we're going to shear it, and you can see how the particles move. So let me push play. I'll, I'll play this a couple times, but I'll just push play and you can observe whatever catches your eye here. So there that plate's moving. You can really see those particles kind of rolling around, sliding past each other. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause it and drag the slider back to the beginning. So, uh, it's a pretty cool video, lots to watch, but what I want you to focus on this time is something you probably didn't look at the first time you watched it, which is what's happening to this top plate. Look at the top plate up there, that top metal plate this time. So I'm going to push play. All right, so you probably have noticed now that that top plate moved up, right? That means the soil dilated during shear stress, during the application of this uh, loading condition. Let's do it one more time, watch that again. It starts out low, and then as the soil's shearing, that top plate is moving upward as the soil dilates. All of the dilation is really concentrated down here in the bottom. So you can see as these soil particles move past each other, the whole block of sand kind of moves up. So all of the dilation, all the shear strain is happening down here. And then the top plate stops moving, right? As the bottom plate continues moving, the top plate stops. So the soil has reached a uh, critical state condition and it's not going to continue uh, moving anymore. There's one that's cyclic as well. So uh, let me go full screen on this one too. 
here's the cyclic one moving back and forth, and now you can really get a sense for the dilation. You notice that the sand dilates during loading, and then during unloading it contracts back, and then it dilates again, and during reverse loading, it looks like the soil is breathing in and out. I've always wanted to put like that Darth Vader breathing sound with this video, just for, uh, just for fun. So anyway, those videos are there. You could watch them and remember these concepts as we go. So, um, okay, the reason why I wanted to show this is that um, these concepts have a, an important um, application to the Moore Coulomb failure criterion. We tend to assume that the Moore Coulomb failure criterion assumes that the failure surface is a straight line. So that's what I've drawn right here, right? Tau versus sigma prime. We've got this little more circle, and we're saying, like, here's the failure surface. That circle is that failure. And the surface has two parameters, a C prime and a phi prime, and it's a straight line. However, we've observed from any tests now that the actual failure surface is curved. It's not a straight line. So it looks something like what's drawn in that lower figure. So what's up with that? Why is that failure surface actually curved? whereas we often assume it to be a straight line. Well, it's related to critical state soil mechanics. And in particular, there are two key concepts from critical state soil mechanics that contribute to this observation. First of all, soil is more dilated at low confining stress. So we've talked about the fact that dense soil is more dilated than loose soil. That makes sense because the denser the particles are packed, the more they have to kind of move up past each other in order to start straining. Um, the other concept that comes from critical state soil mechanics is that confining pressure has an impact on that latency too. So if you don't put very much confining pressure on the soil and you shear it, it's easier for those particles to move up because there's less pressure pushing them together. Um, so whether a soil is actually dense or loose is a combination of its density, its void ratio, and also, it's confining pressure. If you take a dense sand and put more confining pressure on it, it will become less dilated, right? And therefore, it's less dense in a way. Similarly, at, at, high, at low confining pressure, it might be really strongly dilated. All right, now the second concept is that dilation has the effect of increasing the friction angle. And uh, you can probably understand that best by thinking about it using this sawtooth analogy here. So um, if we have two metal plates that have these saw teeth cut into them, and we push horizontally on the top metal plate while the bottom metal plate is fixed to a table or something like that, some of the horizontal force is going into failing the interface between the two pieces of metal. But in order for the, two, the top metal piece to slide horizontally, it also has to move upward. Right? And so part of the force is pushing that plate up, and you have to push harder if these angles are steep. If this was perfectly flat, you would have to push less. Well, this is directly analogous to dilatancy, because as you're pushing on the sawtooth, part of it's moving up, that's dilation. Right? If this was level, there would be no dilatancy, it would be easier to push it. So that's kind of an uh, intuitive way of understanding that friction angles are higher when dilation is high. All right, so if we did uh, a test now on a particular sand, uh, and we can find it at really low pressure, and we did the test, and we measured the peak stress in the stress strain curve, and then we took that same sand and confined it to higher pressure and measured the peak stress in the stress strain curve, we would find a couple things. First, at higher pressure, the sand will be stronger. The more circle will be bigger. But second, the friction angle will be higher for the one at low confining pressure. So even though the more circle is lower, it's at a higher friction angle. So when I've, draw, I've drawn that kind of here, maybe I'll draw tangents to these circles in red lines here. So there's the friction angle for the test done at low confining pressure. Here's a tangent for the test done at kind of this higher confining pressure. So phi prime peak is higher at uh, low confining pressure. And what ends up happening now, if you were to repeat this test at a whole bunch of different confining pressures, is that you would find that the 
failure surface is actually curved, right? It's not a straight line. Eventually, it will reach a straight line plateau. Um, but at the beginning, the peak friction angles are much higher. Now, um, here's the problem that we, that we face. Let's say that we did these two tests, the blue line and the, the, these two blue circles, and we assumed that the um, more Coulomb failure criterion was valid. The straight line fit worked, so we fit this green line to it. Well, we would end up over-predicting the strength quite a bit at low confining pressure. We might also over-predict up here at high confining pressure, although generally the misfit is not that bad at high confining pressure. Maybe the way I drew it is not quite perfect here. But uh, anyway, the lessons are that we should perform lab tests. I need to plug in my computer here. We need to perform our lab tests at values of confining pressure that reasonably match field loading conditions. So if we restrict our laboratory testing investigation to the range we anticipate to occur in the field, we'll get uh, something reasonable. Um, if we get a C prime greater than zero for soil that we know is not cohesive, like let's say you scoop up a bunch of sand out of a bag and the particles are not cemented together, it's like beach sand, you might get a non-zero C prime if you do a more Coulomb fit to it. Well, you should be highly skeptical of that, right? You know that at zero effective stress, the sand is loose, it will just fall apart. So that's a good indication that you actually have a curved failure surface and your straight line is actually lying to you, right? It might fit the data okay in the range where you did the test, but you know it's not going to fit very well at low confining pressure. Um, another alternative is that you could fit a curved surface to the data, right, instead of fitting a straight line. And there are computer programs that allow you to put 